Compañeros, welcome to the SQL Data Partners podcast, the podcast dedicated to SQL Server-related topics, which is designed to help you become familiar with what's out there, how you might use those features or ideas on how you might apply them in your environments. I am Carlos El Chacon. And I am Steve Stedman. We are two data professionals trying to help others get a better handle on their database environments, either through this podcast, our training, or our consulting practice. Thanks for joining us on the SQL Trail. Welcome to the show. SQL Data Partners. Compañeros, welcome again to episode 95. We're glad you could join in. For those who have been listening for a while, thank you for a while. Thank you for staying with us. If you're new to the episodes or new to the podcast, welcome. We hope you enjoy what we have to share with you. It's almost been 10 episodes since we've had a channel advisor employee. So we've invited Kevin Fiesel back to chat with us today. Yeah. Or is channel advisor sponsoring us, Carlos? <laughs> I should send an invoice and just see what happens there. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, so this week, the guest is Kevin Fiesel. Kevin's a Microsoft MVP, and he works as a DBA and big data guru at Channel Advisor. Yes, that's right. And so they are playing with lots of the features of SQL Server, and so it's always kind of fun to talk with them because they kind of tend to be, I won't, maybe bleeding edge is not the right word, but no, actually, I, I will say bleeding edge because they were a 2016 adoptee before it was actually officially released. You know, they're in communication with Microsoft. They're using lots lots of the product. Uh, uh, and uh, and so Polybase is, uh, is, is another example. Yep, and that brings us to this week's topic, which is Polybase. That's right. So interesting topic. I didn't know too much about it. I know that it has been compared to kind of a peanut butter and jelly analogy, right? So you have your Hadoop data or your quote-unquote big data repositories, and then how do you connect SQL Server to it and this enter Polybase? Yes, exactly. And I think that uh, it's a really interesting tool with a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. And I think we will see more out of it coming in the future. Yeah, that's right. So I think an interesting um, conversation with Kevin. And so, of course, we appreciate him coming on the podcast again. Do we have any Compañero shout outs this week? We do have a couple of shout outs. So we want to give a shout out to Andy Jones. This is regarding the episode. So that was episode 92. He thought that we uh, covered some interesting things. And the special feature about ignoring the column order, he thought was going to be uh, a big deal for a lot of devs. And I happen to agree. So I think that uh, we appreciate you, Andy, chiming in there. And we have another shout out from uh, LinkedIn or via LinkedIn from Dalton Ruer. And this is regarding episode 94, which was on Click. And uh, Dalton said, awesome podcast interview with DBA and Clicky Michael Armentrout describing how Click relates to SQL. And then he went on to say, if you love SQL databases like I do or are curious at what makes Click different than other SQL join statements, you should definitely listen to this. Which I find flattering uh, because Dalton uh, actually works for Click. And so it was kind of nice to get uh, a little bit of love from those guys' information, knowing that we covered it in a nonpartisan way, and uh, but it also provided some information as to the whys you might want to take a peek at it or what it can do for your organization. So. Yep. Yes, indeed. So other topics to cover, Compañero Conference coming up in yes. October. Which, interestingly enough, Kevin, among others, has uh, codenamed Compacon. And uh, so that's kind of a catchy name, and uh, we'll have to see if that uh, if that sticks. Yeah, uh, so I think he just doesn't like to say Compañero. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know, so I, I, that is uh, something that, so as myself, I, I, I've used that word a lot, right, in, in, in Spanish. And uh, so for, for those English speakers, not a word that you've heard or used before. So I can, uh, I can appreciate you wanting to switch that up a little. Yep. And I know for those who've listened to the podcast for some time, I'm sure you've heard me trip up on it a couple times. <laughs> the time a couple times. 
That's anyway. right. But that's the great thing about uh, what we're what we're doing here in the sequel family at large is that we can come, we can trip up, and uh, you know, but we still get along and and enjoy chatting with one another. Yeah. So one of the things we're going to be doing at the conference is a hands-on office hours section, and this would be basically a time where, uh, let's say you've gone to a session and you want to really give it a try. Uh, and we're going to have a block of time allocated where all the presenters will be available. So if you want to try out something that Kevin or one of the other speakers talked about, we'll all be there to help people hands-on walk through whatever it is you're trying to do. And I think that that's a big value add that you don't necessarily see at a lot of other conferences. No, exactly. And so we're hoping to have some scenarios that you can walk through. You can use your own environments. We, you know, we can set up some test environments. You know, Azure will probably... And so these details are going are gonna to be forthcoming. But the idea is we want to sit down, you bring your laptop, right? So you're going you're gonna to have to have, use your own equipment, basically, and get down and we'll have the instructions there. And so this will be the, the ability for you to actually see it in action, go through the steps, ask questions as needed, and, and then you know, be able to move forward and take that back with you. So I think that's going to be a, yeah, an interesting addition to the conference. And with Kevin Fiesel there as a speaker, he'll, of course, be part of that and talking about Polybase and give you a chance to uh, do some hands-on things with that. And just remember, Kevin is only one of the MVPs that we have in our lineup. Uh, we're not going to tell you who all the other ones are yet, but those will be coming out in the next few weeks. That's right. We have a couple of aces up our sleeve, and we're, we're excited about the, the lineup that we're getting I guess they could cheat a little bit, uh, Steve. Maybe that's an incentive to go to the website. Compañero. For a short amount of time that you can go to compañeroconference.com and register now. That's exactly right. We've made a change there. And so basically we're going to honor the $400 price until June 16th. So if, as you're you know, trying to decide what you want to do, that we had a request for a couple more that weren't sure that they were going to be able to access that that price. So we've made that available until June 16th. So we can, you know, we can accept more at that price point than just the original 10 that we were going to offer. Yeah, I'm looking forward to the conference, a chance to meet some of our listeners and uh, learn something along the way and help share what we know. That's right. It's going to be good. And now for a little SQL Server in the news. We've got some Power BI to talk about. Yes, I know. This is an interesting topic. So for a long time, well, a long time, since Power BI has been out at least. Sure. And you have PowerBI.com where you can push your Power BI reports out there and share them. A lot of people have .com where you can push your Power BI reports out there and share them. A lot of people have asked, is there going to be a Power BI on-premise server? And mm -hmm. there's been a lot of really vague answers on that. And just a few days ago, Microsoft announced that they will have a new product coming out called the Power BI Report Server. And it's basically an on-premise Power BI server. And it's built on top of the SSRS technology. And it will include all of the reporting service capabilities, including operational or RDL reports, which that's one of those things there's been a lot of people asking, well, is Power BI just going to push those old sort of paginated RDL reports away? And I've wondered along the way, and now Microsoft has clarified that, that no, they're not pushing that away and they will be supported as part of the Power BI server. No, exactly. And it makes sense that there would, that there would be a merger of sorts and that you could kind of have the best of, best of both worlds. I think, what initially, what, I think what initially what Power BI was lacking was that ability to generate reports kind of on demand, if you will, or, or I won't say static, but... Every day I need to see these numbers. Or I need to have the reports emailed to me, things like that. And so I think it makes a lot of sense. And it's a great move to kind of have the best of both worlds, if you will, there. Yep. And that has been announced that it will be available in late in second quarter 2017. So we're in second quarter 2017 right now. So we don't have long to wait. That's right. Yeah, it, should, it will be interesting. We also, this coming week, we're going to be releasing a new version of the Database Health Monitor. Yes, uh, that will be the May release, and included in that are some new features around monitoring multiple databases at the same time. So right now with Database Health Monitor, you go in and you browse through all the databases and check on things, but we've done some cross-instance cross reporting that will show back DB known good dates across all of the instances you're connected to. 
And that was really something I added because I got tired of jumping around to see all those things. And I thought if we had them in all, all in one place, it would save a whole lot of time. Yes. I guess, you know, that conversation we had with Sean as well kind of pushed us in that direction as well to say, hey, we, you know, there should be one place that we look to see all of this information. And so I think that's going to be a, a neat, uh, neat enhancement. And then also included with that are some small, small features and bug fixes just to help with this, improve the quality all the way around. Yep. So look for that around the time this episode airs. So the show notes will be available for today's episode at sqldatapartners.com slash polybase. Or at sqldatapartners.com slash 95 for the episode number. That's right. So I think let's uh, go ahead and jump into the conversation with Kevin. Let's do it. Kevin, our all-time podcast episode, uh, you know, or title. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yes, thanks for uh, for coming and talking with us. Uh, one of the things that, uh, and one of the reasons we continue to have you on is you're doing lots of different interesting things. And, you know, as database administrators, we've been hearing this for a little while, this idea of big data. And, you know, it's kind of been at the door. Lots of people, you know, even even from a past, you know, perspective, you know, they've, they've opened the doors to the analytics, the kind of trying to join those two worlds. But for a lot of us, it's still kind of a, an unknown uh, entity. It's different technology. And we think that we have something here that will kind of save the day, if, if you will, in a sense. And so our topic today is Polybase. And uh, we wanted to talk with you about it. You've been talking about it and presenting on it and working with it. So why don't you give us the, uh, the tour of, of Polybase? What is it and why would we be interested in it? Sure. Here's the next. It's been around for a so it was part of a SQL Server Parallel Data Warehouse Edition, okay, which later became APS. Otherwise, it's otherwise known as Extremely Expensive Edition. <laughs> Enterprise is expensive. PDW APS, extremely expensive. Gotcha. In SQL Server 2016, this was brought down to the masses, or at least the masses who could afford Enterprise Edition. <laughs> it As such, it's been around for a few years, but 2016... Feels like first version for the rest of us who didn't have a chance to play with the really expensive hardware. Gotcha. The concept of what Polybase does at a really high level is it allows you to integrate with other data sources. So before people start thinking, oh no, it's linked servers all over again. <laughs> it's not linked servers. It's, it's not that bad. Well, that's good. <laughs> So before people start thinking, oh, no, it's linked servers all over again, <laughs> it's not linked servers. It's, it's not that bad. Well, that's good. <laughs> so as of today, Polybase supports a few different links. You can connect to a Hadoop cluster. We can connect to Azure Blob Storage. And we can use Polybase to migrate data from Azure Blob Storage into Azure SQL Data Warehouse. At Past Summit 2016, there were a couple of interesting keynotes where they talked about expanding Polybase beyond Hadoop and Azure Blob Storage, looking into Elasticsearch, MongoDB, Teradata, Oracle, and other sources as well. Wow. So basically, we're going to have the ability through a SQL Server Management Studio to be able to interact with, move data to and from, all of the and pull that and be able to query it using just regular T SQL. So when you create this table, you create what's called an external table. It's a right. concept that lives on the uh, source server, like it, the Hadoop cluster. The data is over in Hadoop. But okay. when you query that table, select star from my external table, it's going to go over, request data from the Hadoop cluster, and pull that data back into SQL Server where you can treat it like it just came from a local table. Gotcha. So now is, is it going to store that from a time, like a time basis so that, you know, I run my select star and then 10 minutes later, Steve runs his. Is it going to pull that data back over again? Or is there, there some management now that we have to think about because the data is now in my SQL server? So the data doesn't really get persisted to SQL server. It's an external table, meaning that it'll live in blob store, who should know about? The data is now in my SQL server? 
So the data doesn't really get persisted to SQL Server. It's an external table, meaning that it'll live in blob storage or on your Hadoop cluster. The mechanic that uh, Polybase uses to allow this to work is it'll pull the data into SQL Server into a temp table, but it's not a temp table that you should know about as a developer of a T-SQL query. It's kind of like a behind-the-scenes temp table that then gotcha. acts as the table that you're going to query against. So you query dbo.myexternal table. Behind the scenes, there's a secret temp table, and it has the form and structure of that external table. Data gets pulled in, collected, and then processed as though it were local. But once it's done, it's gone. So then that process sounds very similar to sort of the underlying workings behind when you run a query over a of data, the rest of the query locally. And I guess, I mean, I'm just trying to understand the correlation there is, is there a big difference in how that's being done versus a link server? So there's one major difference, and okay. that is the concept of predicate pushdown. So the idea here is, let's say that I have a petabyte of data in this Hadoop cluster. And petabyte of data in this folder, I want to be able to query. I'm sending a query that maybe I just want a few thousand rows. Mm -hmm. Or I want to aggregate the data in such a way that I don't get a petabyte back. I just get the few thousand rows I need. Right. Hopefully, because if you're returning a, a petabyte of data, you're, you're going to be in trouble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't have a petabyte of data on my SQL Server instances. I... <laughs> so... I write this query in my where clause. Uh, maybe I do summations, group buys, halvings. All of that predicate will get sent to the Hadoop cluster, form the operations that you wrote in T-SQL. Gotcha. It generates all that data, uh, the jobs. It creates the data set that comes back and gets pulled into SQL Server. So with a linked server, if I were doing a linked server to another SQL instance, well, another SQL instance is a special case. But if I were doing it to Oracle, I have to pull the whole data set back. Or if I'm querying out to Hive, I have to pull the whole data set back and then any filters get applied. Gotcha. So predicate pushdown is what lets you uh, get back the rows that you need, only the rows that you need, and gets around that whole link server problem where, oh yeah, I'm querying a billion rows, I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah. Sure. Very interesting. I've heard some people speculate that uh, link servers are dead or will be going away uh, because of what we can do with Polybase. Do you think that that's a fair assessment? I am crossing my fingers, hoping that this is so. <laughs> as soon as they talked about years, hoping that this is so. <laughs> as soon as they announced at 2016 past summit what Polybase is going to do in the future, I got really excited because I th I. Th thought about, wait, what if I could connect to another SQL Server instance? And there's one extra bit of Polybase that I haven't talked about yet. That is the concept of head nodes versus compute nodes. So there's a, this, instant, this concept in massive parallel processing that you have a head node. This is the orchestrator. This is the server that knows what queries are supposed to come in and out. And then it passes off details to different compute nodes. In Hadoop, you have a name node and you have a bunch of data nodes. Over in Polybase, there's actually a similar infrastructure. So there is a head node, that's your SQL Server instance, must be Enterprise Edition, and it controls the jobs. But you can divvy out work to differ. Interesting. So I can have, these are standard edition SQL Server instances that I can have sitting there doing work connecting to this Hadoop cluster, to the different data nodes on the Hadoop cluster, pulling data back, and getting aggregated data back to my head node. So unlike a linked server where I have to pull all the data over to my one instance, I can now have several poly-based servers getting data, aggregating it locally, sending it up to the head node, sending up that aggregated uh, as fine as they could data back to the head node, where the head node finishes aggregation and presents to the end user the results. Very interesting. It's kind of a scale out, yeah, scale out approach. Now, I guess it, at this point, it might be worth kind of going back and talking about some of the things that I need to put in place. Now, you mentioned kind of this architecture perspective, right? You know, I have an enterprise version I can have, right? You know, I have an enterprise version I can have standard versions, but 
if let's just scale it down a little bit, I just have one node and I want to start using Polybase. What are some of the things that I need to create or, or steps I would need to take in order to set that up? Okay, so let's take the easiest example. That's connecting to Azure Blob Storage. On my SQL Server instance, I have to install Polybase. That's a part of the setup. There's a little checkbox you can select. But in order to install Polybase, you must install the Oracle Java runtime environment. <laughs> yes, I, I, I cheated and I was looking at the docs here and I saw that and I thought, what in the world? You know, it's talk about sleeping with the enemy, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. Just to recap then, if I want to query uh, against Azure Blob Storage with Polybase, when I install SQL Server, I need to also install, and then you get it as part of the install, but install, but Oracle components for the uh, Oracle Java runtime. Correct. So you install those. There's a couple of configuration steps that are involved. Uh, like there's uh, setting an SP configure that allows for external queries. Turn all this stuff on. There are configuration guides that can help you with that. Once you've sure. got that done, the next thing that you do after you've configured Polybase is you want to create an external data source. For Azure Blob Storage, we create this external data source that points to the WASB address of your Blob Storage uh, container location. So you'll point to the container and the account name. Right. And then you'll That's give still a, a, a URL, right? Yeah, that is a WASB or WASBS address. Okay. So it's a Azure Blob Storage uh, location. Gotcha. So you create this data source. The next thing that you want to do is you create a file. So an external file format. That file format says any files that are on this on a source that I specify, any files are going to follow this format. There are a few different formats. One of them is delimited text. So just text, maybe comma delimited or semicolon delimited or however you've delimited your text. You can use other formats as well. I would recommend starting out just use delimited text. It's easiest to understand. You, know, you can grab a file and look at it. But when you start asking about better performance, one of the better formats is ORC, which is a row columnar format that Hive uses to store data. So it's much more efficient for querying, especially aggregating data. But I don't know. I don't is a row columnar format that Hive uses to store data. So it's much more efficient for querying, especially aggregating data. But you can just use flat files. So, so knuckle dragging Neanderthal, right, that I am, how am I supposed to choose what kind of file I need to use? Is there, is there like, uh, if I'm going to be, I don't know, I don't, I don't know anything about Hadoop, how would I, how would I choose that? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So knuckle dragger, delimited file. Just okay. <laughs> keep, keep it easy for yourself. Uh, once, you once you get past that, once you kind of get past the doorway and you say, okay, now how do I get, do better? You have to think about whether your data is more of aggregation, like what you would find in a warehouse fact table. In that case, I would use ORC. If I'm storing the data and it's more of a row store style data, I would use Parquet. There are that really are supported within Polybase. Well, now, so in that determination, let's say, again, so I'm going to use the, you know, the delimited file. You know, I start... I'm, I don't know, three months in, right? I start writing queries or there's processes that I now have in place. And I decide that, hey, I think I can do better. I want to change the format. Am I going to have to like start redoing my queries or what's, the, what's all involved if I wanted to change that format down the line? So great question. What you would have to do, let's say you have delimited files now. You've created an external file format that's of delimited type. Mm-hmm. Later on, you say, well, I'm actually storing this as Parquet. Right. So you create an external file format as Parquet. And now we get to the last portion of a Polybase external table. You create an external table. So the table has a two-part name. It looks like any other table when you query it, dbo.ple. Mm -hmm. You have the column definitions. 
So all of the attributes in your table. And at the bottom, the part that's a, a little different is there's a with clause. And inside that with clause, you specify the location of your data. So those would be the specific uh, file or folder that you want to point to. The data source and the file format. Gotcha. If, so when I wanted to do a new, if I wanted to change file formats, I'm changing my, I'm creating a new external table. Yeah, or you just drop and recreate the one that's there. The external oh, gotcha. table doesn't have any data. It just has some metadata around it. So if you can, if you have a few second downtime, you can drop that table, recreate the table, use the new format, maybe point to a new folder that has the uh, data in the different format. Right. And all the... Exactly, all the nasty work. Okay. Exactly, all the nasty work of converting those files, getting them into the other format. Yeah, you still have to do that stuff, but you okay. can do that as a backfill process, or you can do that kind of off to the side and just switch when you're done. That way, you don't have to update any of your procedures or any uh, calling code. Gotcha. Okay. That's yeah. So that's that's nice. So then, when you say the external file doesn't really have anything more than just the definition there. That's the definition that sits on your SQL server that's defining where it's going to go and get that data, for instance, out of Azure Blob Storage. So it's really just a, a pointer off to that data, and you're, you're switching it around. Uh, and if you point it to a, a different format file, you have to give it that format type appropriately. Yeah, so the, ex the external table, yeah, it's just, it's just metadata. Yep. It's just uh, some basic information. Okay. So then I'll for insert and then start filling it in with data from there. Or does that file in Azure Blob Storage have to have been created somewhere else to meet those formats? That's a really good question. So you have the ability to insert data into Blob Storage or into Hadoop. There's another configuration option you have to turn on to allow for inserting. And once you do, each insert operation you do will create some number of files in Blob Storage or in Hadoop. So you have to have a folder as your right location. But every time you insert, maybe you're inserting once a month. You're taking last month's financial data, all the individual transactions, and you're writing it over to Blob Storage for long-term storage. That insert generates eight files over in Azure Blob Storage, and then the data is there. You can query it just like it was always there. So the data is there. You can query it just like it was always there. But you cannot update that data from Polybase. You cannot delete that data from Polybase. Sure. Interesting. So now, obviously, you know, this is going to vary, right, from place to place. So... But from a a setup perspective, let's say, right? So again, I'm the only database administrator in my organization, or you know, I'm not familiar with Hadoop or these other. Well, I, I guess as we, we when the other databases get uh, onboarded, then there'll be more access, right? But when I think from a big data perspective, generally. There's going to be another team, maybe a vendor comes in, right, installs Hadoop, starts loading data, things like that. Are we, as database administrators, are we we're going to have to, those components that you just talked about, are the Hadoop vendors familiar with Polybase? Is this something like, are we talking the same language here, or is this still something kind of a very SQL Server-centric uh, idea? Does that make sense? I would say that... Vendors, they're not really going to know an, a lot about the Polybase details. They're probably not going to be familiar enough with Polybase itself to do it. I've had some discussions with people who work at Hadoop vendors, and they're very interested in the concept, but there's not a lot of internalized information around there. You know, these are sure. typically not people who spend a lot of time in SQL Server with SQL Server, so they don't necessarily know how it works, how to set it up, what the positive and negative aspects are, and how you can shoot yourself in the foot. <laughs> well, so speaking of that, right, so what are the ways that we can shoot ourselves in the foot? Oh, you had to go and ask that. <laughs> <laughs> so what are the ways that we can shoot ourselves in the foot? Oh, you had to go and ask that. <laughs>
there are some assumptions that are built into the way that Polybase works today. And I won't, this is not a critique of the Polybase team, of the developers, of the PMs. This is not at all a critique aimed at them. I like you guys still, don't worry. Uh, so, <laughs> so one issue that you can run into is, let's say you have just text data and your file has new lines in it but the new lines don't rep represent new lines of data. Maybe it's a freeform text field where a person typed in new lines to symbolize a new paragraph. Gotcha. Well, Polybase doesn't understand this idea of ignore new lines unless I tell you that it's a new line. It'll oh. just pick up that new line and say, oh, yeah, you've got a new, a new line here. There are some assumptions that are built in. You can also burn yourself by defining your result set. So you create that external table, and maybe you define a value as an integer. Well, if the value comes back as a string because some of the data is malformed coming in, then those rows will be rejected, as they oh, should. Sure. So you're going from a non-structured or a semi-structured system into a very structured system in SQL Server. Right. That semi-structured system is okay with you throwing whatever garbage you want into this file, but you have to define structure when you pull it out. Historically, on the Hadoop side, that structure was defined in the mapping and reduction phases, so map reduce. It was defined by the developer putting together the uh, data in such a way there, the uh, data in such a way that the developer understood what this data point signifies. Polybase simplifies that a lot for us by making an assumption that there is a consistent definition for each row. So we say right. an integer age is the first value. Well, it's going to assume that there is an, an integer value there, and it's going to populate age with that. If maybe every 20th row we have something that's totally different, maybe instead of age, it's eye color, because something weird happened with our data, well, every 20th row gets rejected. And the way you can shoot yourself in the foot, let's go back to you have a few billion rows of data that you want to uh, pull over. Maybe you want to get just um, everywhere where the person is exactly 14 years of age. So you're scanning through this data, and every one of those rows gets rejected. There's a cutoff for the number of records that you are allowed to reject before just failing a query. That cutoff can be zero, or it can be as many as you want. It can be a percentage or a numeric value. So let's say one billion rows, and you have a cutoff of uh, 5,000. Well, you're going to go through quite a few records to get 5,000 rejected rows. Right. And once it's done, once rejection happens, once failure occurs, the entire transaction's rolled back and you don't get to see the data that was there already. It's just, it's rolled back. There was an error. Oh, gotcha. That's right. Yeah. So you may be sitting there for an hour waiting for this data to process and it comes back and it fails. Yeah, so we might almost think about it in a sense. Now, you know, again, not trying to discount, you know, Hadoop, but at least it's like, you know, so an Excel file, right? I want to load that into something that I can accept it and then let me take care of finalizing any of that. And so I can look at rejected rows, things like that, almost like an ETL process, right? Sure. And this, this is a fairly common pattern in the Hadoop ecosystem as well, where, okay, we have our raw data coming in. It just... It's there. We put it into the data lake. Right. Um, so ideally, the data lake has a lot of nice, clean data. In reality, it's more like a data swamp. It's <laughs> where you throw in a bunch of old stuff. You got mattresses in there. It's all kinds of dirtiness. And, Fish with three eyes. You know. Yeah, exactly. And so you pull that stuff out, and you try to clean it up in some process. Usually, it's going to be a Hadoop process. Maybe it's a Spark job, a MapReduce job that scrubs this data tries to give it some semblance of sense and then writes it out to another directory where it's more of a more of a structured for who's working with and then writes it out to another directory where it's more of a more of a structured format 
And that way you can read it in Hive, which is SQL for Hadoop. You can read it with Spark SQL, SQL for Spark. Or you can read it with Polybase, SQL for SQL. Gotcha. So that kind of almost goes back or takes me back to that idea again of kind of the who's working with who type idea. And it almost sounds like if we wanted to, we could push some of that to it's like, hey, guys, can we work on this MapReduce? Or is that a fair question to say, hey, can we work on this so that when the data comes back, it gets cleansed before I see it? Or is that still kind of a, you know, I need to, as a SQL Server person, assume all responsibility for, for that kind of thing? I think that depends on your environment. It depends on relative levels of familiarity. But personally, my expectation would be that if you are distributed the final results, then I believe that it makes perfect sense to ask the people on the Hadoop side, hey guys, give me the data in a format that I can pull it easily. So for example, maybe we are reading a lot of data coming in from IoT devices. We have Kafka set up. Kafka is a big distributed message broker. It's a really fascinating thing. And we're getting tremendous numbers of messages that are streaming into our Hadoop cluster. We're cleaning up those results, we're storing the results, and maybe we have some aggregations that we're doing to show hourly results by device type. And then load that data into a file that Polybase can read. As part of an ETL process, you may pull that data over to SQL Server, persist it in SQL Server. So query, like select from your table, insert into data set that you can use to populate a Power BI grid or that you could use to populate a web application. In that scenario, personally, I'd argue that, yeah, the Hadoop side people probably should be doing most of the cleanup work. If you are both sides, it becomes more a question of, well, what am I more comfortable doing? Like sometimes right. if the data is relatively clean to begin with, or if we're willing to accept a certain level of failure, eh, take it, bring it into SQL Server. I can do really cool things in SQL Server. Right. So it, it kind of goes back right to the adage of knowing your data. Right? Yep. Absolutely. Be, being familiar with it and then making a decision based on that. Right. So then back to that example with the uh, the age and putting that into an integer column in the table definition, uh, do you see that, I mean, there's lots of things that could be valid for ages in there. You could have 6MO to represent someone who's six months old. But then obviously when that gets pulled down and try to go into an integer, it's got, if it is something, there's lots of things that could be valid for ages in there. You could have 6MO to represent someone who's six months old. But then obviously when that gets pulled down and try to go into an integer, it's got text data in there and it's not going to work. So do you find that people sort of shy away from those more restrictive types in their table definitions and maybe just leave it as something that's more open, like a Varchar Max or something like that? Or do you find that people go through the battle of cleaning it up or filtering it ahead of time? Unfortunately, probably more the former. It's more of, well, it's a string. Every string works, so we'll pull <laughs> it in as a string and then we'll clean it up here. Right. That is a downside where with a lot of ETL, true ETL tools, I can take a data element, I can make decisions based off of what that element looks like. Like 6MO, I can do a substring, I can parse out, is there an MO or is it YR or some known value here and use conditional logic to doesn't do the transformations for you. Okay. So another area that I've, I've thought a little bit about is that, and I know sort of jumping back to the whole link server example, is that when you're running a query and sort of old school link server, uh, whatever's going on on the other side really gets hidden from execution plans. It's just blindly calling something on the other mm -hmm. side across the link server and your execution plan doesn't give you any details other than it was waiting on something on the other side. Right. Uh, now, when you're look, are, is there an option for seeing execution plans when you're using Polybase to get a better understanding of uh, if your query is taking some time, maybe where that time is being taken on when it's connecting out to Hadoop or Azure Blob Storage? Yeah, the short answer is yes. The long answer is yes. If you look at the XML, so you look at the query plan XML, it will give you some details, including there's a remote query, which is L. So you look at the query plan XML, it will give you some details, including there's a remote query, 
which is XML inside of the XML. So you have to deserialize the XML, decode the XML, and you'll be able to see what the remote operation looks like. So it gives you a few indicators of what's happening. It'll show you the individual steps. Also, there are several dynamic management views that are exposed for Polybase. And those DMVs will show you a lot of the same information. They'll show you the individual steps that occur for this MapReduce process or for the data retrieval process. So I think very interesting topic, and you know, we'll, we'll let you give last thoughts here. But one of the things that, that I feel that I'm confident about or happy about is that while there's still some unknowns here, right? Having unknowns here, right? Having the Hadoop, you know, in my environment or being able to connect to it, Azure Blob Storage, all these other things that are, that are coming down the pike, at least it's going to be, I have, now have a tool that I can do or integrate with some of these things on my own turf. And it's not completely foreign that I'd have to go and, you know, pick up new technologies you know, right away. Yes, that. That's how I'm thinking of it. This is why I like it so much. This is why, honestly, I think this was the best feature in SQL Server 2016. A lot of people are going to say, Query Store is the best feature. Query Store is an awesome feature, but Polybase gives you this integration and it's opening this door to possibly getting rid of linked servers. It's opening a door to distributing queries, distributing those really expensive SQL Server queries, kind of like what you do in Azure SQL Data Warehouse. I'm hoping that maybe we get something like that uh, locally. So I know you talked about how uh, poly migration. Uh, is there anything that that's in there new with Polybase that you know about? Nothing new with Polybase. Gotcha. Okay. There's a whole but, bunch uh, of really uh, cool uh, stuff I'm excited about, but right. sure. And but, I guess so it's a fair question to think, or I, I don't want to use the word assume, but it will be supported in a Linux version as well, because it's a core feature, if you will. I know they've been working and uh, talking with Travis, uh, you know, the PM over there uh, for the Linux uh, migration. That's what they've been. That's what they've been uh, trying to 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 accommodate. Uh, again, listening to the AMP conference or event or whatever it was called, they did mention some additional functionality that would be in the Linux version. I don't remember them specifically calling out Polybase, but you know, yeah, I have to imagine that it will be there if, if even if it's not there on day one. The answer that I think is safe to give is in today's CTP, CTP, the answer that I think is safe to give is in today's CTP, CTP2 for SQL on Linux, there is not poly-based support. Gotcha. But, okay. but uh, there is no reason that poly-based cannot be there. Gotcha. But again... Well, now we we did. So I guess we did mention that this is ultimately an enterprise only feature, right? Yeah, for the head node, it has to be enterprise edition. I think even with um, SQL Server 2016 SP1, I think it's still required to be enterprise edition for the head node. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, I feel like that Polybase was in the list of things that they made available in the lower editions, but I'm not sure if that is yeah if that includes the the head node or not. Yeah, so, I know that the compute node was um, available in, in standard edition, but I'm not sure. Yeah. So given that it's been a little... I don't know if... About, well, around a year, roughly. And with Polybase sort of being mainstream available since then, do you see that a lot of people are actually adopting this and using it in production environments? Or do you see more people are just sort of experimenting and trying things out at this point? It's more of experimentation. I don't know of many companies that are doing it. Uh, the, the way that I would put it is, okay, well, you have to have SQL Server 2016, which already cuts out a large slice of companies. Sure. You have to have ex uh, Enterprise Edition, <laughs> and you have to have a Hadoop cluster. Uh, or you could use Azure Blob Storage and get value out of it that way. But this is going to be a fairly narrow segment of the population even today. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, perhaps after this podcast, more people will... Uh, Give it a shot. <laughs> yeah, I hope That's so. That's right. Compañeros, if you are using Polybase after what you've heard here today, I want to know about it. Polybase after what you've heard here today, I want to know about it. <laughs> we were going to report that to Microsoft. Let them know. You heard it here first, folks. 
<laughs> okay, so I know you've been on the show here before, Kevin, but we're going to still go through Sequel Family. Excellent. Can we do it? I think so. I, I may make up new answers. <laughs> well, we do have a couple of new questions that I think that have changed since the last time you were uh, an individual guest. So, Okay. So the first question is, it, how did you get started with SQL Server? I got started as a web developer. It was about a decade ago. And I was an ASP.NET Web Forms developer. It's my first real job. So I was the person who was least afraid of databases. I had written, <laughs> written SQL queries before, and we had a need for database think of, and we had a need for database administration. So I... How hard could it be? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Like, hey, why is the server failing? Oh, it's because it's out of disk space. <laughs> All there right. You go. And now you know the rest of the story. So if you could change one thing about SQL Server, what would it be? That's a good question, because everything that I think of tends to happen, which is really cool. I like that. Um, <laughs> so I last time around, I said, I want Polybase to support Spark. And I'd like to see that happen still. Okay. I've wanted Python support for uh, machine learning within... Uh, our services, which is now machine learning services. And we just got that. So that's really cool. The thing that I want most right now is a really good client for Linux. So I want Management Studio for Linux or I, oh. SSMS does. Interesting. In all flavors of Linux, or do you have a particular flavor that you're interested in? I'm I'm kind of okay with pretty much any flavor. I mean you can you can get it to work. I Nowadays, I'll use Ubuntu or Elementary a lot. Uh, previously, I've done a lot of Red Hat. I go back to Mandrake for people who are in the know. Right. Gotcha. Yeah, and I know recently we heard that, uh, oh, what was it? SQL Command was going to be available on the Mac, and that was a big move. Yeah. And uh, I think we're a long ways off from Management Studio being on other platforms. But who knows? I could be wrong there. Yeah, it's, yeah. I'm looking forward to whatever they are able to provide. No, I know that'd be certainly cool. Although we, we and we do have a request, I should say we do have a request into the PM for SQL Server Management Studio, and uh, we haven't quite been able to uh, to get them on the show just yet. But when we do, we'll ask them that question. <laughs> <laughs> Put them on the spot. That's right. Spot. That's right. Okay. So, best piece of career advice you've received? I'm gonna flip this on its head. Best career advice I can give. Oh, here we go. Learn right. something new, especially if. If you're in a shop where you're on SQL Server 2005, take some of your own time. Learn something new. I, it doesn't matter that much what it is, but expand out just a little bit. It can be features. It could be new versions of SQL Server. It could be, let's learn a new language. Let's learn a new part of the stack. But don't get so caught up in this one little part that you find out someday that, oh, look, your job has been automated away and you <laughs> lost you lost all of those skills to learn. You learned right. something the first time. You can learn something again. So that would be my advice. And that is why we're going to have you as a speaker at the Compañero Conference. So, folks, if you want to uh, hang out more with Kevin and learn all of his uh, wisdom, you can uh, come to the conference and, uh, and hang out with us. And on to our last SQL family question. If you could have one superhero power, what would it be and why would you want it? We are getting close to episode 100. Nobody else has ever answered it this way. I want phase walking. I want the shadow cat kitty pride, be able to phase through walls, phase through objects. Nobody else has answered that. So either I'm completely insane and picking the wrong power or I'm, <laughs> I'm ahead of the curve. I'll, I'll let the audience decide. Or it could be you've just answered the question several times before as well, and you've had more time to think about it too. That's, <laughs> that is also possible. <laughs> All right. Very good. Awesome, Kevin. Thanks again for stopping by. We always enjoy it. And glad to come here. So what do you think, Steve? Uh, you think Polybase is going to be around for a while? I think it will. I think that it sounds like there's support for a certain amount of connectivity to different databases and big data sources today. But it sounds like there's a lot of activity to different databases and big data sources today. But it sounds like there's a lot more options coming in the future. And I think that we're just on really the bleeding edge of 
polybase today. And I think we're going to see lots more over the next few years. No, I agree. Some some exciting announcements around that. And I think because you've seen Microsoft go all in on the analytics components by allowing Python and JSON and R and all these other technologies into SQL Server, that though the environments, the database environments are going to become a little bit more ubiquitous, if you will. So those walls are going to come, come a tumbling down. <laughs> and, uh, and so I think they're going to want that connectivity. And I think Polybase is going to play a, you know, a big role there. Yep. And so it'll be interesting to see how that evolves. Yep. Uh, and the other takeaway I had on this is just, wow, Channel Advisor. I mean, those guys are using all the fun stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Thanks again, Kevin, for joining us today. We do appreciate it and uh, always enjoy talking with him. And we'll be looking forward to having him at the uh, Compañero Conference. Our music for SQL Server in the News is by Mansardian, used under Creative Commons. If you have a topic that you want to uh, us to talk about, you can leave us a note at sqldatapartners.com slash podcast, or you can reach out to us on social media. I am on Twitter at Carlos El Chacon. And I'm on Twitter at SQL EMT. And we'll see you on the SQL Trail. Partners.